Okay, so I think that we're going to get going. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our SEDS online webinar. We're happy to have you join us. Um, we have a great presentation for you today, but first I would like to thank the IAS for the sponsorship for SEDS online, which allows us to offer all of the tools that we have um, available free to all of you. So make sure and check out what's on our website, all of the virtual field trips, um, scientific webinars, great, uh, great resources for this, this new teaching semester. So today's lecture is by Arnud Slutman, who's a postdoc at King Fahd University in Saudi Arabia. He got his bachelor's and his master's from Utrecht University before moving on to the University of Geneva for his PhD. Arnud has an interest in process-based sedimentology, particularly in bed forms and their resulting sedimentary structures. His research really integrates theory, experiments, and field work. So with that, Arnud, I will give you the mic and look forward to a great presentation. Thank you, Chelsea. So I also look forward to a, a nice presentation. And I'm not sure if I could have chosen a bigger topic, actually, to give a presentation about. Because this is about flows and fluid dynamics and about flow regimes and bad forms. So that's kind of uh, uh, inclusive. And the motivation for this talk really is actually a, uh, a critical themed issue that is supposed to come out in the summer of uh, next year. And I'd like to thank also my co-authors, uh, Mathieu, Dario, Alex, and Stephen, with whom we are uh, co-guest um, um, editing actually this, uh, this issue. And this will, so if you can't catch it uh, now or at, uh, at once, you can read this again and, um, uh, by, uh, by early next summer. So just to give you a, a short overview of what we are going to do in this presentation, I'll take you through a short introduction to explain actually why we would want to study bed forms uh, at all. And then we come to the aim of this talk, actually, which is really to evaluate if the flow regimes are still up to date, if the lower and upper flow regime uh, uh, still work, uh, especially with the addition uh, of uh, cyclic steps um, about 25 years ago. And we do that by making sort of a table in which we list all the properties of, uh, of the bed forms and try to link that with the, with the flow regimes in which they form and the coherent flow structures that lie at the origin of those uh, bed forms. And finally, we, we check out some uh, future challenges that we uh, st still face um, uh, because we, there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet. So we're really exploring and um, that could be a good ground for a good discussion uh, afterwards as well. So why would we like to study bed forms at all, except for the fact that they are awesome, of course. That is um, because if we consider a uh, depositional system that is characterized by a combination of an environment, of an environment and, a, uh, and a climate, the flows in that environment have a certain uh, discharge characteristics, certain flow velocities, flow depths. So those are the given uh, flow properties in that system. And if there's sediment around, the sediment will be uh, interacting with the flow. And that will occur through these coherent flow structures that form in the flow as a function of, uh, of uh, turbulence and of, um, of uh, sediment grain size and of flow velocity and all those things. So the, the processes, actually, the interaction between the coherent flow structures and the loose sediment bed result in the creation of bed forms, which is the topography that forms on the sediment surface. And that may actually end up in the depositional record. So sedimentary structures form on the short term, which are controlled by local aggregation rates. But if you want to know what happens on the long term, you need to take into account uh, geological factors such as uh, basin subsidence or sea level changes. And if you go from the system towards a depositional uh, record like we discussed now, that's the forward problem. But very often in sedimentology, we actually look at it as, as, it, as an inverse problem. So we have a depositional record and from that, we try to uh, find out what the properties of the system is. And this is not only on Earth, but you can imagine also that if you have, uh, if you want to go to Mars, we're getting new images from Mars, for example, you want to know something about the system. But you can only do that if you have the link between the system and the depositional record. And that's actually where bed forms come in because the bed forms tell you something about the, the properties of the flow. 
but only if you understand the, the links uh, correctly. So this is a very important link. We are not the first one to actually study uh, bad forms. There's a long tradition over more than 100 years, actually. And a very good way to uh, study bad forms actually by uh, bad form stability diagrams. And in the bad form stability diagram, you plot parameters against each other. And um, typically in a flume experiment, so in the laboratory, and you see what, uh, what the bad forms are that evolving under that set of conditions. For example, here on the horizontal axis, you see sediment grain size, and on the vertical axis, flow velocity. And at low velocities and fine, uh, fine sand, ripples evolve. But when the flow velocity increases, yeah, and, uh, and the grain size gets bigger as well, then they form dunes. But the dunes are eventually uh, washed out if you keep increasing the flow velocity to form a plain bed. And then there is the, the, the anti-dunes. And typically, the stability diagrams stop there at the anti-dunes. What we want to do today is go above. But, uh, but we have to look at uh, how we actually define the, the, the flow regimes. And how that is done, the upper and lower flow regime, that's actually, um, let me see if I can hide it. Yeah, that's actually uh, uh, by a critical value of uh, a parameter that is called the fruit number. This is the critical value, the red line, and above is supercritical, so above that uh, critical value, and below is subcritical. And that's actually where the term supercritical and subcritical come from. And we'll go uh, and look at this in, uh, in more detail uh, soon. Uh, but first, let's have a look where antigens actually come from. So antigens have been introduced in the literature about uh, more than a century ago, actually, when French words were still written in French by, uh, by uh, Gilbert, who built an enormous uh, flume tank, one of these uh, laboratory ex uh, experimental apparatus in the garden of the university. It was really tens of meters long. And he looked at, the, at what bed forms evolved with uh, different kinds of sediments and different uh, flow properties. And what he saw is that next to dunes, there were also these, uh, these other kind of bed forms, which he called anti-dunes, because they are contrasted with dunes in their direction of movement. And they travel against the current instead of with it. So where dunes go downstream, anti-dunes actually travel upstream. He also noticed that they travel much faster than dunes and that their profiles are typically more symmetric. And anti-dunes, though less common than dunes in nature, are by no means rare. So this is not a freak um, uh, bad form or something like that. It, it really occurs in nature as well, as we will uh, see uh, in a minute. And then for about a long lifetime, like uh, 80, that's 80 years? Yeah, 80 years, the, uh, nothing really anti dunes was like the top of the of the platform stability diagram but only 25 years ago it was recognized that there's actually another bad form that is important which are called cyclic steps and cyclic steps can be uh, thought of as a series of uh, upstream and upslope uh, migrating bad undulations in which the overlining flow shows a series of hydraulic jumps that sit in the trough and uh, we did an inventory of, um, uh, of how, much, how many citations there were since the introduction of the term. And we see that, especially in the past few years, there have been a lot of publications dealing with cyclic steps. And is this, um, is this because um, uh, they were not recognized before, or are we kind of getting lazy and maybe overinterpreting the depositional record that and anywhere we find uh, a a hydraulic jump, we think, oh, this could be a cyclic step. And that's a, that's a, a pitfall. That's actually a danger. And when you go to, um, uh, to conferences, well, hopefully uh, soon again, there's a lot of talks about cyclic steps. And sometimes I get the impression that people are getting a bit bored about these cyclic steps. But I can assure you, this is not going to be a cyclic step talk. We are going to, to really look at, um, at where we come from in the platform stability diagram and how the cyclic steps actually fit in. And before we do that, let's have a look at the, at the bad forms we are dealing with. So um, this is actually the, um, uh, the same bad form stability diagram that we saw earlier, but now extended into the upper flow regime. This is very useful if you're interested to see uh, what a certain grain size uh, produces in terms of bad forms under a certain flow velocity. If you have a flow that is 10 to 15 centimeters deep, 
but only if you have a flow that is 10 to 15 centimeters deep. I mean, you kind if you if you talk about it like that, you kind of uh, really limit yourself in its applicability. It would be much nicer if you if you can also predict it uh, if the flow would be two meters deep, for example. Now, and therefore, instead of using absolute values, we rather use uh, dimensionless uh, values like the like the fruit number, which is actually a ratio between inertial forces and the gravitational forces. Here represented by the, the flow velocity and the square root of uh, gravity times uh, the flow depth. And this kind of shows the, the, the conditions, much more generally applicable, the conditions in which uh, the platforms form. And you can do the same for the horizontal axis. Here, there is the suspension uh, index by uh, Yokokawa. Um, and on the left, that's a uh, bed load uh, dominated. On the right is uh, suspension dominated. And this is the the ratio, which is not very important now, but it's the ratio between the settling velocity and the shear velocity in the flow. It's very useful if you are interested to, to see that downstream migrating antigens, that load is very important, whereas for upstream migrating antigens, less so, and for cyclic steps, you need a lot of suspended sediment for them to occur. Another important uh, dimensionless parameter that we that is very useful to think about is the is a wave number, which is dimensionalized by a multiplication with the with the flow depth to make it again to make it more applicable. Because you can think about bed forms also as waves on the sediment bed, so that the bed forms themselves are actually waves on the sediment bed. Now you have to um, we're going to see this uh, several times, so I'd, I'd like to properly introduce it here. So um, uh, on the left of the dimensionless wave number, we talk about long bed forms or long wavelength in shallow flow. And on the right, that's short wavelength in the, in the deeper flow. And here again, the, uh, the normal fruit number that we will come to speak about um, much more intensely. So the rationale, what do we want to do in, uh, in this talk? Is actually we there are three important bad form types: uh, the dunes, anti-dunes, and cyclic stamps. But we only have two flow regimes. So um, is something wrong here? Do we have a potential problem? Maybe not, but uh, probably yes. And maybe it could be that this uh, the, the the flow regimes that we are thinking about uh, now is kind of outdated because it was uh, designed when we did not yet have cyclic steps around. And of course, a lot of people are now observing cyclic steps. Maybe it's time to look what lies beyond the antigens. And maybe we have to think about an upper upper flow regime or something like this. And um, uh, in which the, the flow regime actually oversteps another boundary, which could be indicated by the Vedernikov number that we will see in a moment. The way we are going to deal with this is to make a, not a bad form stability um, diagram, but, uh, but like a table which we have the most important um, uh, bed forms. And these are not the only bed forms around. I know there's, uh, there's also chevrons and anti-chevrons, and, but we're not going to, uh, to look at those um, uh, bed forms because this is a really good start for which we can take it further. And these are the, this is kind of the structure of the talk. We're going to look at the characteristics of the bed forms, then uh, try to link that to the flow regime and see what coherent flow structure or Hydraulic instability lies at the origin of this um, uh, of these bed forms. So let's start with the characteristics. Let's see what the configuration between the bed and the flow is, and if there is a phase relation in which directions these uh, bed forms move, and if that makes sense. Um, bed forms are created, and um, yeah, so the creation of bed forms and their migration is controlled by the pattern of acceleration and deceleration. So I was talking about the flume experiments, and the photos that I'm showing here are kind of uh, all the same uh, scale, so they are really comparable. They're all free surface flows, which means they are not uh, in a pipe. They actually they can deform the upper upper part of the flow, so like a river, and there's air uh, uh, on top of the water. So we have the sediment bed and the flow is going over it. And when we look at the uh, dunes, dunes have actually a very weak out of phase relationship with the, with the free surface of the flow, which means that where the bed form has its highest point, the flow services has actually its lowest point. And where the bed has its lowest point, the flow has its highest point. This creates uh, changes in the cross section of the flow. 
here the cross section is is thinner and here it's thicker so that leads to to acceleration and deceleration because the flow has to go faster in the shallow part than in the deeper part and when it is accelerating we are prone to erode the bed form so we are eroding sand on the stall side and we are actually depositing it on the lee side where deceleration occurs and as a result of this we take sand from the stall side and put it on the lee side and as a result the bed form migrates downstream uh, with the flow now when we look at anti dunes they are strongly in phase bed forms which means that where the bed form is highest also the flow surface is highest and although it is not very strong here in the, in the, these examples because typically in the drawings we very much exaggerate the vertical uh, scale what you can see here for downstream migrating antigens although both upstream and downstream migrating are in phase the place where the acceleration occurs is different in the downstream migrating acceleration occurs on the stall side so on the up upstream uh, phase so we are eroding sand here on the on the stall side and we deposit it on the lee side so like dunes downstream migrating antigens hence the name migrate uh, downstream Whereas in upstream migrating antigens, this is the other way around. Acceleration actually occurs on the lee side. So that's where the flow is accelerating. And that's where we have erosion. So we remove sand from the lee side and we deposit it on the stall side. So the sand, of course, is moving with the flow in the downstream direction. But the bed form, so the wave on the sediment, is actually migrating upstream. So it's moving uh, the opposite direction of, um, uh, of dunes. Now, and finally, we have uh, cyclic steps. And the first thing that you can notice when you see this image, and remember that this is kind of all the same scale, this is a much thinner flow compared to the flow over dunes and anti-dunes, compared to the wavelength of, um, uh, of the platform. What we see here is we have an acceleration of the flow on the lee side and uh, deceleration on the stall side. So also cyclic steps migrate upstream and upslope. Um, however, the phase relationship is not very clear. It's not really in phase, but it's also not out of phase. It, it seems to have kind of both of them. Now, with this uh, information, we can just start filling in our, uh, our table. So the configuration actually controls uh, whether it's out of phase, in phase, or both. And uh, because the um, and that so the phase relationship controls where acceleration and deceleration occurs, which in turn controls whether the bed form is the migrating downstream or upstream, which is very useful actually to to think about it uh, like this. But now we are interested, of course. Ah, that was too too quick. Yeah, I have to mention there is also other bed forms. There's uh, in particularly the there's the the plane beds. So just after initiation of motion. A plane bed is formed. This is the lower flow stage plane beds between uh, dunes and anti dunes. We form the upper flow uh, plane beds. And also at the very extreme end, even cyclic steps can be uh, washed out to form extreme plane beds if you, if you like. Now, the next step in our uh, uh, stability table is to look at uh, flow regimes because we want to know what, what causes the fact whether these bed forms are out of phase or in phase or, or both. And a very useful number for that that we have already encountered is the fruit number, which gives you an idea about the criticality of the flow. <clears throat> so as a kid, I love to play in the, in the rivers. And I was always wondering if uh, how the flow reacts to a, uh, a, a, a bowler that I place uh, in the river. How do you know if it's going to be a suppression of the flow or an amplification of the flow? Is there any way in which we can, uh, can predict this? Maybe you can think of yourself already if you know the answer. And a useful term, a useful method in thinking about this is uh, by means of the fruit number. Just as a, as a recap again, so the fruit number is the ratio between the flow velocity representing inertial terms and the square root of gravity times the flow depth. So flow velocity and, and, uh, and flow depth, uh, the thickness of the flow, those are the main uh, parameters here. And it turns out that when the flow is subcritical, yeah, so when, uh, when the, the lower term is larger, so at low flow velocities and, uh, and, uh, and thick flows, the, we have a suppression of the, of the flow surface. 
Whereas in supercritical flows, which are fast and thin flows, we have an amplification of the of the of the flow with respect to the bed. Now, and this is always uh, very scary to do in a presentation, but um, if you want to understand these things, you have to talk about fluid mechanics and the language of fluid mechanics is mathematics. And as a sedimentologist, we like to turn the mathematics back into sand grains. So that's what I'm really going to try. But in the next slide, there will be quite some, uh, some um, uh, expressions and mathematical things, but I, we go really slowly through it. And I promise that's the only slide where we do this. So just, uh, just bear with me. And we start with uh, the Bernoulli theorem, which is kind of an energy balance that states that the work done by the fluid pressure is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the flow. In other words, you cannot lose energy as the flow and you cannot gain uh, energy uh, when, when you when you when you flow, yeah. And then we ignore uh, uh, turbulence, so the the friction that we lose, um, the energy we lose to friction uh, by turbulence. So the energy in the system is constant. Now, the most important parameters that we are dealing with here is the flow depth, the flow velocity, and the height of the of the sediment bed. And uh, recall that uh, the the discharge is the product of the flow depth and the flow velocity. So the discharge has both of these uh, terms in there. And instead of talking in units of energy, which would be uh, joule or calorie or something like this, we can also talk, and that's really a method that we that is uh, common in hydraulic engineering. We can talk about the energy level in terms of, uh, of a head, which is the energy level measured in meters, so in units uh, length. And without going into detail, we can see that the parameters that we are interested in, namely the flow depth, the height of the of the bed at uh, the elevation of the channel floor and the flow velocity are all represented in there to to form a total head now we can do a trick we can move the the velocity head to the other side of the equal sign such that we can define a new um, uh, new parameter which is called the specific energy which is a function uh, so we can measure the energy as a function of the flow depth and the discharge so that's a kind of elegant, right? We have the, all the three parameters we're interested in. And by changing the discharge and the flow depth, yeah, and the, 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 we can plot that. And then we can say something about, um, about the energy level. Now, if we do that, this is what uh, such a typical uh, diagram looks like. So the specific energy on the horizontal axis and, then, and the flow depth on the vertical axis. And each of the cues, so each um, uh, of the discharges has its own curve. So for each value of the discharge, there is one curve. For, now let's take as an example, this curve. So this is one discharge. And as a function of the energy level of the, of the, of the system, now we can, we can say something about the, the flow depth and how this works. So this is the bed form that we are considering. And when the flow direction is from left to right, yeah, the flow will first encounter the, the low um, uh, elevation, and then it will go to the crest of the bed form. So the, the, the energy is actually being lowered, right? The energy is being lowered. So in the specific energy diagram, you go from H1 to H2. That is represented by a shift to the left. Now, what you can do, you can just uh, find the intersection between the, that specific energy level, which is here the purple dot, for the for the for the new um, uh, energy level, which is this purple dot, and if you look at the purple ones, yeah, the the you can see that there is a free surface drop. So the flow depth is actually decreasing as the specific energy is also decreasing, but that's only for the upper limb of the curve. Uh, and if you are on the upper limb of the curve, you are out of phase because the flow depth is decreasing when the channel bed is increasing. But if you are on the lower curve, on the lower limb of the curve, the, the, the channel is actually, the, the free surface actually arises. Now, and now the question is, how do you know on which uh, limb you are? Now, and for this, we do a mathematical trick. And this is the last difficult thing that we're going to do. For this curve, there's only one value at the minimum specific energy. So in the, that's in the, in the vertex of the, of the parabola. And that's where the vertical tangent is actually zero. 
So what we can do, the, the formula that we have for the specific energy, we can uh, make a partial uh, derivation and say where it's zero. If we do that, then the solution is a function of the discharge and the, and the flow depth. And recall that your discharge is the, multi is the product of the flow velocity and the flow depth. And then we find that, um, that all the minimum values of the specific energy plot on the line that in, for which the, the flow velocity is equal to the square root of, uh, of dt. Now, if you are in the upper part and if your flow velocity is actually lower than the square root of uh, GD, then you have to use the, the upper limb. And if it's the other way around, if flow velocity is larger, you have to take the lower limb. That's very useful because with this, we can make the, the fruit number. Uh, instead of, uh, of equating the, the velocities like this, we can just take the ratio and we can actually say, okay, so this is subcritical. If you're subcritical, you have a drop in the free service. And if you're supercritical, you have a rise in the free surface. So that's where the fruit number comes from. And that's very, very useful, actually, because now we can already fill another line of our stability uh, table. So dunes form in subcritical flows. The transition occurs at fruit number is one, and antidunes form in supercritical flows. But we have a problem for cyclic steps because there we have sometimes subcritical and sometimes supercritical. The flow is supercritical over the lee side and subcritical on the stall side with this hydraulic jump in between. So we're not there yet. But let's, um, so instead of plotting the fruit number, what we can also do is to just uh, look at the, at the velocity ratios. So when the flow velocity is larger or smaller than the, um, uh, than the square root of, uh, of GD. And that is actually a practical meaning. Now, without going into uh, much detail, if we think about waves, there's actually different kind of waves. And there's kind of two end member waves. There's the waves that we call dynamic waves, and there's the waves that we call kinematic waves. And the dynamic waves, that's the ones we are most familiar with. They are the ones that occur in the open sea. They are the ones that occur in deep water that are relatively short with respect to the, to the water depth. And because they are so deep, the friction can be neglected. So these are the terms in the equation of motion. You can see here, there's no friction of the bad slope. That's easy because then the wave is actually only uh, a translation of energy. There's no net water movement. So the water is not moving. It's only the energy in the form of a wave that is moving over a water surface. Now, and we denote that by W. That's the velocity uh, at this at this side of the asymptotic uh, value. So that's for short waves in, uh, in deep water. That's the propagation velocity. These are energy transporting waves. And let's do an experiment. Now we have a flume tank and we look at it uh, from above. So this is a plan view and the water is not flowing. So it's standing water and we throw a pebble in the water, just one pebble, there's an impact. And because the waves will travel at constant speed in all directions, what we can see is these ripples forming a uh, circle. So the, the wave is actually uh, propagating, forming these uh, nice circles because the, the velocity of the waves, which is given here uh, by the square root of GD, the lower term in the fruit number is, uh, is constant. Now what happens if the flow is moving slowly? So it's moving slowly, which is typical for subcritical flows, such that the velocity of the waves, the propagation celerity of the waves is much faster than that of the flow, which means that the waves can still migrate upstream, though a little bit less because they have to travel against the stream, but still they can travel upstream. So we still have waves moving upstream and downstream. Of course, there's a critical value when the velocity of the waves is the same as the velocity of the water. And if that's the case, we say that the flow is critical and the fruit number is one. So there is a point at the point of impact, actually, where the beyond which the waves can, uh, can travel no longer. And then there's the supercritical flow. The flow is now so fast that it's actually faster than the velocity of the waves which means that the, that the waves cannot travel upstream anymore, but can only travel downstream. So the circles that were, that were nicely uh, just uh, propagating in a, in a concentric way 
uh, when there was in still water, they are now forming these these uh, downstream moving circles, uh, um, like in the wave envelope. This is kind of similar to a uh, a jet, uh, a fighter jet going through the the barrier of sound. Now, so um, if it's supercritical, then the waves can travel only downstream. Now, when we look at this example, this is a river going over a weir. So a very nice hydraulically designed uh, structure. And we have now knowledge about the, the fruit number because we know that when the flow is slow and the, and the flow is thick, we have a subcritical flow. So here the flow is thick and slow and the flow is subcritical, but it accelerates when it goes over this obstruction over the weir such that it becomes supercritical. And then beyond the downstream of the weir, the flow is subcritical again because the flow decelerates, so it's slow and thick and thick. Think about the waves. The waves can travel in both directions in the upstream part, but they can only travel downstream when they go over the over the thin and fast flow in the weir that is supercritical. This is no problem. The problem arises at the transition from the subcritical part to the supercritical part. Yeah? So where the supercritical flow abuts the subcritical part because the waves that uh, can migrate in the upstream direction, they can do so until they reach the supercritical flow. And these waves are transporting energy. So what's happening, the energy is kind of getting stuck. So what you get is a shock wave of the accumulation of energy. And that is called the hydraulic jump. So the hydraulic jump is a shock wave, the accumulation of energy or waves. Now, and um, hydraulic jumps, you don't need a very high um, extreme conditions to encounter them because you can also find them in your kitchen sink, although in a laminar flow. So that's kind of the, yeah. So that's a, that's a hydraulic jump as well. And also it's a, it's a very useful way uh, to actually uh, generate turbulence and to lose energy uh, in, the, in the system uh, by friction. So engineers really like that to, uh, to prevent that the, 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 the river gets uh, gains too much energy actually. So that's another reason why you see uh, hydraulic jumps uh, in engineering purposes. But anyway, this is the, so that's the, that's the hydraulic jump. We can also think about these energy transporting dynamic waves as vectors of morphodynamic information. What does that mean? It means that the flow in subcritical flow, because the waves already traveled upstream from the obstruction that the flow actually knows that there is a obstruction downstream. And because it knows that in 10 or 20 or something meters, it's going to encounter this bad form, it's going to adapt to that. It's going to speed up, right? It's getting thinner and faster. So it's going to, uh, it reacts before it actually encounters it. Whereas in a supercritical flow, no information about the bad form has traveled upstream. So the flow can, only, it doesn't know that there is a bad form. It can only react when it encounters it. And that's why the, that's another way of looking at why we have uh, amplification of the, of the flow with respect to the, to the bad form. Now, that's a long story. What have we learned uh, from this? So we can also look at the velocity ratios, uh, not the square root of GD, but thinking about it as uh, the velocity between the flow and that of waves. Yeah, here the flow is faster than the waves and here, sorry, here the, the waves are faster than the flow and here the flow is faster than the waves. And we have now learned about the transition. So if you go from a subcritical flow to a supercritical flow, that's a smooth transition. But if you go the other way around from supercritical to subcritical, you encounter a hydraulic jump. Did we learn anything about the cyclic steps uh, yet? Not really, because we still have a problem about the co-occurrence of subcritical and supercritical and that alternating. So maybe we have to look at that in another way. And that is because we can define two types of fruit number actually. There's the local fruit number, which, uh, which is calculated by using the local flow velocity and the local flow thickness. And there's the normal fruit number. And that's the fruit number that the flow would have if there would not have been any bad forms. So if you remove the bad forms, but you keep the, the discharge of the flow the same, then that's the fruit number that you get. And why is this important? Because here you can actually see that um, uh, this is uh, data from uh, experiments and it shows the, um, uh, the, the calculation of the fruit number 
in percentages. So which uh, which fruit numbers are in a time-wise uh, manner uh, more abundant? And you can see that antigens have have a higher 50% uh, uh, fruit number than cyclic steps uh, do. So maybe you should not look at the, at the median fruit number, but a way around this is to look at the 90% uh, percentile to introduce the, the, the normal fruit number that may resemble the normal fruit number more closely than the median fruit number does. And then, the cyclic steps are actually a supercritical bad form. So they belong in the upper flow regime. That's correct. They are in the right place, but you have to look at the normal fruit number. Okay, that as a, as a side note. Let's see, yeah. There is an empty uh, space here, which we can uh, fill with another uh, property of the flow. Yeah, so we had subcritical and two times supercritical. And now we're going to look at stability. And what that means, uh, we're going to look at that uh, by uh, using a derivation from uh, Federnikov, which we're going to look at. So this is again the waves that we have seen before, but instead of looking at dynamic waves in, in deep water, uh, short waves in deep water, we're going to look at the other asymptote, which are long waves in shallow water. And because they are so long in shallow water, they actually start feeling the bottom of the, of the flow. So we have to take into account the friction of the bed. And that's what happens in the kinematic wave bed. So friction cannot be neglected for long waves in shallow water. The propagation, of, um, the propagation velocity of these waves is a function of this factor beta minus one uh, and the flow velocity. So it's a multiplication of the flow velocity. Now, a typical value of uh, beta is between 1.5 and, uh, and less than uh, less than two. And that depends on uh, what your channel looks like. What is the hydraulic radius? Is it a triangular? Is it a very wide? Is it a rectangle? And also which uh, friction coefficient uh, you choose, the French one or the, or the, or the English one. Um, and what is important, whereas dynamic waves were only transporting energy, kinematic waves are actually transporting mass. They're not only transporting energy, they're transporting mass. Now, let's have an ex example of, uh, for this, uh, compare it with, uh, with sea waves, <clears throat> because we are more familiar with that than waves on a, on a, on a, on a flow, actually, like, like a river. But this is in the, in the sea. If you are in deep water, we all know that, uh, that uh, it's only the energy that is propagating. It's not the water itself. Okay, The water makes a circular motion, but the net movement of the water is zero. But if you and when you enter the shallow water, the wave starts to feel the bottom. And when it starts feeling the bottom, there's friction. So you have to take into account the friction. And slowly they are going to move the mass um, such that the fluid particles actually move out of the mass. You can, you, can, uh, you can think of this as the fluid particles moving faster than the wave, than the energy transporting wave is moving. And when it starts to go faster than the wave, they become mass transporting waves. Yeah, and this is typical for, uh, for overland flow. So if you have a dam break or something, yeah, that's a, and, and flood waves, that's a typical uh, mass transporting wave. And we will look at examples, don't worry. So going back to our kinematic waves, the mass transporting waves, their velocity, which is given by, um, uh, by V, uh, seems to be kind of um, uh, constant. It's, a, it's an asymptotic value. But the velocity of your uh, dynamic waves, that's a function of your fruit number. And what we are interested in is which wave is dominant. Here, if we look at fruit numbers between zero and one, we also know that we can have negative values, right? The flow, the wave can also propagate upstream. So we have also negative values of the relative wave celerity. But let, let's look at this. So the dynamic waves are the fastest ones. So they are the dominant waves in the fruit number between zero and one. At the fruit number of uh, zero, that's when we can have no longer um, uh, upstream propagating uh, waves. Yeah, nothing changes. It's still that the dynamic wave is still dominant with respect to the kinematic waves. But we see that, uh, that the value, that the difference is uh, lowering when we increase the fruit number. And when we are in a fruit number of two, 
the velocity of the kinematic waves and the dynamic waves, so the mass transporting waves and the energy transporting waves is equal. And when we overstep this boundary, because we are looking for boundaries, critical values, <clears throat> yeah, when, uh, when we overstep the fruit number of two, then the kinematic waves become the fastest waves in the flow. So that's when the flow actually becomes, the waves become mass transporting. So that's a long and difficult story. Let's see how, uh, how that ends up uh, in our table. So we are going to add a velocity ratio. We see that V, which is the velocity of kinematic waves, the mass transporting waves, becomes faster than the velocity of energy transporting waves. This is known in fluid mechanics as roll waves developing. Now, let's have a look at those roll waves. These are roll waves, which are surge trains. Surge trains are, are pulses of, uh, of uh, flow. So there's actually acceleration and deceleration. And this is the point when, uh, when the flow becomes unstable. So there's, it's, an, it's not a constant um, uh, discharge anymore, but there's pulses in the flow. And you can imagine this can have a very important uh, role if you have a mobile sediment bed around. Now, these are examples from a spillway from, uh, from um, uh, artificial uh, reservoirs um, also here. And they are sometimes referred to as Cornish waves because uh, Cornish was one of the first to observe them. And he described them as uh, flood waves uh, going over the, over the flow, going propagating through the flow with a velocity higher than the flow velocity. So surges are like hydraulic jumps, but they are not hydraulic jumps. Yeah, and um, it goes too far to look at the, at the comparison, but uh, you can read everything about it in the paper that is uh, going to be uh, following this, uh, this talk. But what is important is that in 2012, so about uh, 10 years ago, cyclic steps and rollways were linked for the, for the first time. They, um, they did the numerical experiments and they, uh, they had the rollways developing on an erodible bed and cyclic steps emerged. And they, they don't, they still don't know uh, exactly how the how that works, but uh, but it's a clear link uh, between roll waves and uh, cyclic steps. That's good information for us because now we can actually um, uh, complete our uh, our table. But before we do that, we introduce another number which you may encounter more and more in the future, which is the Vedernikov number, which is that ratio that we had been talking about. That's the velocity of the mass transporting waves, so the kinematic waves, over that of the dynamic waves. And why I'm showing this so is, is because I want to show that that's actually a function of the fruit number. This is the, uh, the beta factor again, but here your u over square root of gd, that's your fruit number again. So actually you can express the Vedernikov number also as a fruit number. That's very useful because now we know that the flow becomes unstable around fruit numbers of 1.5 to 2. So now we suddenly have kind of three flow regimes. Uh, that, uh, let's have a look at that in the, in the table. So we had criticality as indicated by the fruit number. And now we also have stability. So we can have a subcritical stable flow, a supercritical stable flow, and a supercritical unstable flow. And the values at which that, uh, that happens is like we just have, have seen, that the critical value is the Vedernikov number of one, which coincides depending on the, on the properties of your uh, sediment bed and also of the dimensions at the, the, of your uh, channel. So if it's very wide or very narrow or triangular, and uh, that occurs between 1.5 and two in uh, terms of the, of the fruit number. Uh, before we continue to look at what could be at the origin, uh, the coherent flow structure for antigens, I just want to make mention of the burst and sweep cycle that is believed to lie at the origin of dunes. But I'm not going to talk about that, uh, that here because that would go uh, too far. We don't have time simply. So that's the burst and sweep cycle. I'm, I'm sure you have heard about this and uh, you can read about uh, that uh, elsewhere. So what, the last thing I'd like to talk about is what about the uh, underlayer hydraulic jumps, right? We have seen that the hydraulic jump occurs at the transition from a supercritical flow to a subcritical uh, flow, uh, but we have, not, we have not been looking at different types of jump. And it may be 
and this is actually a challenge uh, for the future, it may be that uh, there is a link between undulate jumps and anti-jumps. This brings us to the future challenges, and I have uh, about four more slides to show you, and that's the end of my presentation. So please bear with me because I know, I'm not sure if I'm still in time, I think so. <clears throat> so there's three uh, future challenges that I want to share uh, with you. And that the first one is the role of the undular uh, hydraulic jump. The, um, um, not all hydraulic jumps have a very strong roller. That's only if the fruit number is larger than 1.5 to 2. Hey, we've seen that number before. That's actually our Vedernikov criterion. And when the when the incoming fruit number, because at the at the downstream side of the of the jump, it's always a subcritical flow. But at the incoming flow, if that's between one and 1.5 or somewhere uh, there, 1.5 to 2, then we don't have this roller, but we actually have a series of waves developing on the flow surface, as you can see here. And we have seen that before in papers dealing with uh, uh, with uh, deep sea channels in which cyclic steps has been uh, observed with these antigens superimposed of that. So maybe this is, maybe there is a link between um, uh, the underlying hydraulic jump and uh, the waves under which potentially antigens can form. We're not the first to think about this. In the late 70s, there were people, Gad Broom and Komar, who looked at, uh, at uh, uh, the flush of, uh, on beaches, and they did experiments and numerical simulations as well. And they actually uh, proposed that these uh, backlash ripples are a kind of antigens forming under an underlock jump. The only problem is that your antigens form in the subcritical part of the hydraulic jump. And that's why it probably never was really popular. So that's, uh, that's something we have to think about. Another thing is, well, everything that I've been showing you, also because of time limitations, is uh, um, the only thing that I've been showing you is, um, is uh, river-like flows. So flows that are uh, the sediment bed, flow, and air. But you, can, you also have uh, turbidity currents, for example, yeah, or density flows, and both are open channel flows in the in the way that they have a free upper, sur upper surface. So the, 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 the flow surface can actually deform. So it's not a pipe flow, that's important. But the density contrast is very different if you have water and air or a turbidity current and uh, the ambient seawater. And this affects the velocity of your waves. So it's much easier for a submerged flow like a turbidity current to become supercritical. And that's probably one of the reasons why everyone is seeing that in the deep sea, why there are so many cyclic steps being discovered now in the deep sea. However, rivers have the highest velocity at the top of the flow, whereas stability currents, they have the highest velocity somewhere at one third of the flow. And also the, the concentration profile in terms of sediment concentration is different between rivers and turbidity currents. And what about internal density stratification? If you have so much sediment, in your flow, then it may actually, uh, the flow may become stratified that you have a high density layer below a lower density layer. And another difference between turbidity currents and rivers is that the hydrograph is very different. And the uh, turbidity current may be uh, more unsteady than a typical river because you go through a head and a body and a tail. So um, that's something we have to think about. And also we have not been talking about the sedimentary structures and uh, that's a good advertisement for the, for the supercritical theme issue of sedimentology, because there will be a lot about the, that. But are sedimentary structures actually unique, or can antidunes form sedimentary structures that really look alike those formed by cyclic steps, both dominated by scour and fill structures, and that you can get convex geometries and the high aggradation rates? And what about the shoot and pulls that I've not been talking about anymore? They are kind of a transitional bed form. So it's not a real bed form. It's more of a transitional um, uh, bed configuration, which may have to do with the antigen cycle, because antigens go through cycles that we also didn't have time to talk about. That's because there is a sediment feedback between deposition and uh, how the flow reacts to antigens actually building up. And we didn't talk about the grain size effects, and not just grain size, but also sorting. And uh, there's a really nice uh, experimental study in the themed issue that you should uh, look at from uh, Ono. Fluid mechanics. We haven't said everything about fluid mechanics, although we have a 
have a strong feeling now about um, uh, about uh, the upper flow regimes, because how exactly do rollways make cyclic steps? That's still not known. Also, the fruit number and the Vedernikov number, they are difficult to calculate, especially if you don't have direct observations of your uh, flow. And what about shear stresses? We haven't been talking about shear stresses, but we know that they are important. However, we can use the fruit number to talk about acceleration and deceleration, so we can talk about changes in shear stress and this uh, migration direction and this effect of uh, flow stratification yeah, that you can have a high density layer uh, overridden by a lower density flow how does that work and i think we can only move forward in the next decade if we have a stronger collaboration between sedimentologists and engineers and mathematicians because many of these issues are actually in the domain of engineers and mathematicians so let's uh, collaborate, and there are already good collaborations. So um, let's continue that. And this is the conclusion slide. Um, and I think that we did a good job by actually um, uh, filling in uh, this um, uh, stability table, if you uh, if you want. So the the one take home message is there are not just uh, two flow regimes, not a lower and an upper, but it's better to think that we have a lower, an upper, and an upper upper. Yeah, or think about subcritical stable, supercritical stable, and supercritical unstable. And with that, I like to uh, to uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you could follow it, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Super! Thank you so much for that um, that seminar. It was um, yeah quite eye opening. Um, so we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but that's great because I already had one <laughs> that I really wanted to ask you. So you started to touch on it a little bit towards the end, um, but my question is really about what happens when we start to add in sediments, so suspended sediment, and what does that look like in terms of sort of those theoretical calculations that you were going through? How, how much alteration needs to be done by those? How valid are those moving forward if you have suspended sediments? Yeah, you, that's a very interesting point that you um, that you uh, that you that you give there. Um, I had some backup slides. Maybe you could just allow me. That's uh, this one. So what actually happens? We were talking about the local fruit number, right? And the fruit number is a function of the flow thickness and the flow velocity. But as the antigen builds up. As the antigen builds up, the flow over it is going to be more amplified. And as a result of that amplification, the flow gets thicker. And as a result of the constant discharge, the flow also gets slower. And if it, if it passes uh, beyond this critical value of, uh, of being slow and thick, then you drop below the critical fruit number. And actually, what you get per definition, you have a transition from supercritical to subcritical flow. So you, you form a hydraulic jump, and that's when the wave breaks. And when this one starts breaking, the next one also starts breaking. So the whole train suddenly disappears. So, so um, yeah, we didn't have, unfortunately, we didn't have time to, to go into that because I love talking about this. But uh, I think it was more important to, to give this message about the upper flow regime. But yeah. anyway, if you put sediment in there, yes, so weird things can happen. And, um, and um, yeah, things like this can happen. And you, you, the YouTube is full of this. That's, um, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, are a lot of people um, doing experiments, I'm sure, with flow tanks, including sediment? Exactly, and, um, and um, sediment is a really complicated uh, thing, actually, because it's not just grain size, it's also the sorting. If you have uh, gravel in between your sand, or if you have uh, cohesive clay in there, things may change, actually. And what about the type of sediments? Uh, a lot of these uh, flows occur in really catastrophic environments like uh, uh, like volcanoes where you have very strong hurricanes. And volcanoclastic uh, material may behave very differently than siliciclastic material. And the same is for carbonate environments. I did my PZ on carbonate uh, sediments and they, they kind of, it's all shell, so they behave different than, uh, than this. Sure, yeah. Yeah, actually one of our last seminars, um, was discussing microplastics and even the, the differences in terms of properties of flow and, and settling um, of microplastics is, is quite different, which, which yeah, yeah, just yeah, another, yeah. <laughs> another yeah, type of thing. And, uh, yeah, shape and density, that's, uh, but that's only complicating factors. 
first you have to understand this and then you can put the sediments uh, sure. in. Yeah. yeah, you have to have the background. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Osman who asks, what kind of sedimentary structures form in cyclic steps? Yeah, so what is the most important um, uh, feature of a cyclic step? That's actually the, the hydraulic jump, right? Because here in the supercritical uh, part, that's mostly erosion taking place. So you will not see any, um, um, you can only find potentially a erosion surface, but typically this uh, gets eroded. What you will find is the sediment that is being rapidly deposited. And you can imagine that in this thin and fast flow, there's a higher sediment concentration. And then suddenly the flow opens up in this uh, hydraulic jump and all the sediment is just massively being dumped. So, uh, so we, we have a very uh, poorly stratified uh, grain sizes that are, sorry, a poorly stratified um, uh, uh, lamination with a lot of um, uh, different grain sizes mixed. So it's poorly sorted. And typically, because there are pulses in the flow, this kind of moves up uh, stepwise. So you have a very clear um, uh, scour and fill structures. And if you're interested in this, and because unfortunately we didn't have the time to look into this, but uh, the, the, the special issue will be full of, uh, of stuff like this. Yes, definitely for, for anybody who's um, sort of in this area of research or interested in it, uh, make sure and check out the special issue. From what I understand, it should be coming out soon-ish, next year, 2021. So yeah, in the, probably around the summer, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have a comment from Ola, watching from Newcastle. Hi, Ola. Um, no questions, but a big thanks. My sedimentology class for, uh, from more than 20 years ago came back in a flash, <laughs> naturally an update. <laughs> yeah. So Amelia is joining us. Can't remember if you're still in Vienna, but um, <laughs> she's joining us and asked a question. Um, hey, maybe this is crazy, but you were talking about non-Earth analogs. So roughly if we change G, um, the ellipsoid you were showing should get narrower or wider, right? But the boundaries between flow regimes would remain the same. Have you tried to recalculate it? For example, Mars? So I didn't do any calculations on that, but you are absolutely correct that it's the so it's, uh, if you change the system, if you change the gravity, for example, then also the velocity of these waves will change. So uh, you will encounter different velocities at which these uh, boundaries occur. And that's, that's actually the same as uh, changing in a turbidity current, your concentration, because with that you change your density contrast, which also controls the, the velocity of the, of the waves on the interface. So, that's kind of uh, of similar, but that that's not the only thing. It's also the the temperature of the water and also the viscosity changes if you have uh, sediment in suspension and and uh, and turbulence. So this is really um, uh, a rough guide, but um, yeah. you can always complicate it. Yeah, of course. Sure, <laughs> maybe some other things to look at in terms of not Earth analogs ideas. And Emilio yeah, was yeah. joining from Erlangen. So okay, our next question is uh, from Pedro, watching from Brazil. Would it be possible to have a forward moving hydraulic jump? Also, can anti dunes erode the sediment bed? Uh, first, uh, first, the last question can anti dunes erode the sediment bed? Uh, absolutely. So, because it's the, it's the local, local aggradation factors that, uh, that control whether you are net depositional or net erosional, right? So, you can, in fact, now we've been looking only at uh, structures in mobile sediment, but you can have similar structures also in bedrock. So without any mobile sediment around. So if you, uh, if you go to, uh, to, to a nice granite exposure where a flow is cutting directly through the, through the granite, then also these kind of steps, uh, cyclic step like um, uh, features evolve. So, and, and the same can happen for sure for antigens. Um, and yeah, so uh, in fact, Supercritical flows are really characterized by a lot of erosion. And that's why it's so difficult to understand their depositional record because there's so much erosion around. There's a lot of scour and fill structures. And uh, but we are getting there. there. There are some diagnostic features that will be summed up. And uh, the second question uh, that you had, a hydraulic jump, can it be uh, translatory as we call it? So if the hydraulic jump is moving, it's not really a hydraulic jump uh, anymore. So 
but you can treat it as a hydraulic jump because it is still a discontinuity. And a very good example is a tidal bore. A tidal bore, when you change something in the system, for example, the, the, the pressure goes up, right? When the tidal wave comes in. So there's actually water coming up to your, uh, your uh, river channel. And um, if you move with the, with the surge front, so your discontinuity, you can pretend that it is a hydraulic jump with water flowing inside, mm -hmm. right? So, so it, yeah, you can uh, you can pretend that it is moving, but um, um, by definition, it's not a hydraulic jump. But these are called surges, and uh, if you if you want to read about this, that's going to be summarized in the state of the art paper, which is uh, which we really dug into, and I, I think we can explain this in uh, in a Mickey Mouse style uh, kind of uh, text balloons. <laughs> So different, different initial mechanisms, but maybe similar outcomes then. Sounds like. Okay, we have a question from Val in Oslo. Um, he's asking what the preservation potential of an anti-dune is if you transition from a supercritical stable flow to a subcritical stable flow. <clears throat> that's a that's a good question. So that depends what your uh, what your sediment does. Again, because um, if you are depositing more than you can carry away, so if you are net ag aggrading, you can deposit anything uh, you want. And um, uh, one of the papers that will be in the in the volume is sort to keep, uh, keep <laughs> talking about this. There's actually that's that's one of my own papers on. Um, um, we look at uh, at three meter thick uh, density flow beds in which the um, there was so much sediment in the system that. The, the flow actually made something of an antigen, and then the antigen bre breaks. Yeah, but uh, it was not able actually to to erode the the sediment because it was already full with uh, with so much. Um, there was already too much sediment in the flow for it to, to erode. So so what you get is all these convex up uh, structures. So so absolutely you can um, uh, you can uh, ah. But you, your question was when you change to a subcritical. Yeah. So subcritical flows typically are uh, thicker and slower, which have lower shear stress. So they will be less likely to erode. So if you change from supercritical to subcritical, it's possible that you can leave your antigens um, uh, in place. But, but again, this is, a, this is a function of your sediment concentration. It's a bit, it's not a straightforward answer, I guess. Okay, one more question. Um from Manasij in uh, UT Austin. Um, hi. So they want to know if um, what the condition for preservation of convex forms and antidune deposits might be. So there is absolutely a preservation potential. But uh, what we've been looking at uh, now mostly is um, so if you look at the literature, then most of the of the sedimentary structures associated with supercritical flows are uh, concave scour and fill structures because you need special conditions if you want to preserve um, if you want to preserve uh, convex up structures because you you can you will make them anyway but you, you will not preserve them so and and the best way to do that is by uh, by increasing the sediment concentration such that the flow is not able to erode it essentially yeah. and this is also uh, there are uh, quite a lot of papers around um, in the turbidity current systems and also for tsunami uh, uh, return flows that talk about these uh, uh, what they call um, uh, hummocky cross stratification and mimicking sedimentary structures. So they look like hummocky cross stratification, but you can produce the same sedimentary structures with antigens. Yeah. And uh, again, <laughs> this uh, nice theme supercritical issue is something to keep an eye on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would also um, also assume or imagine that within, in terms of talking about preservation potential of some of these dune structures, that it would also um, really depend on the sediments that are deposited within this, the dunes, right? And any other, um, say, microbial textures or something that you might have that might sort of um, create a more stable structure. Yeah, absolutely. So if if you look at uh, at the typical turbidite or a um, at the TB section in which you have these uh, nicely climbing uh, ripples, or you look at a um, a uh, splay uh, splay deposit uh, in the in the fluvial uh, system, 
you have so much sediment in the, in the, in your flow that you are not able to erode the bed. So you will preserve, preserve much more of your ripple than you would do under lower sediment concentration conditions. So, so and the, the same for cyclic steps uh, actually. And uh, we had a paper in the Earth Science Reviews that we uh, that came out last year that Slotman and uh, Cartigny. And um, um, there we actually look at the uh, preservation potential of cyclic steps and what you could potentially find in the, uh, in the depositional record. Yeah, because, of, because one thing that I can, I can mention actually, there's that we also didn't have time to go into, there's a link between the wavelength and your flow properties. So especially flow velocity controls the, the wavelength of the antigens, for example. And that's different in the turbidity currents than in the, in the river-like flows. So some of these bed forms that are made may have wavelengths of two kilometers. So that's one bed form. Eh? So that's one wavelength, one bed form that's two kilometers long. You will not find any outcrop in which you can see this. Mm -hmm. But you, you can find this in, in seismic. But what do you see in an outcrop? You, you just see a turbidite. And you have no idea that it is convex uh, structure over a length scale of two kilometers. So there is stuff in the literature that is uh, is being reviewed in that paper that you should have a look at if you're interested in this. So Earth Science Reviews, if you guys are interested in the preservation potential. Yeah. Okay, so our next question is from Roman in Vancouver. Um, how's it going? So he says, hi, Arnud, Thank, uh, fantastic th talk, thanks. What parameter rules the wavelength of the supercritical bed forms? What controls the wavelength? Yeah, what parameter um, controls the wavelength of supercritical bed forms? Yeah, of course, that's uh, gravity. Uh, that's an easy uh, answer. So take into account gravity and flow velocity. Because um, um, as you have seen uh, when I was showing the, the, um, the photographs of the flume experiments in which you had the very nice uh, antigen with the flow going over it, where there's not a lot of flow variation in the, in terms of thickness over the over the the bed, so you can can pretend actually that that's a deep water wave. So you can use um, you can okay. Let's let's start again. So we can link flow velocity. Um, yeah, we can link flow velocity to the wavelength of fluid waves, and because antigens are like uh, deep water waves. We can use that same formula to say something about the wavelength flow velocity relationship for antigens. And there's something similar for cyclic steps, although that's not an easy formula. That's, um, that the, that's all numerical uh, simulations. And um, basically it uh, takes into account the, the slope and uh, uh, how easy it is for the flow to re-accelerate when it comes out of the hydraulic jump. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, but a good, um, Something to keep in mind is that um, three antigens fit in one cyclic step wavelength. That's what we see most often. Interesting. Okay, we have another comment from Manasij um, from Austin. Uh, they say, in seismic scale, we see large upstream migration antigen-like structures, not at the seafloor, but deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very well possible. Yeah, so and that's that's a function of uh, aggradation rate. And if you have a turbidity current and there's a bad form which is seismic scale, you can imagine that it's if the wave breaks, it's not going to clean up that uh, that entire bed form that's hundreds of meters long. So if you want to look for a nice uh, preserve, preserved large scale seismic structures, yeah, that, that's the that's where I would look in the, in submarine channels. Sure. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from Cheng Peng, coming from China. Um, they say, thank you, Arnud. Uh, what is the scale range of cyclic steps and what conditions determine their scale? What's the scale of cyclic steps? Uh, if you have a flow like a turbidity current that is uh, 100 meters thick, you can imagine you get a different uh, scale of bad form than when you have um, a flow uh, on the beach, uh, going back to the sea through the runnel, which is only three centimeters thick. So it really scales with the flow depth. Yeah, it really scales with the flow depth. So you, you can find them in any, um, in any, uh, of any dimension, but you have to find the right flow parameters for that. Mm -hmm. But what we typically see in the deep sea 
so um, is um, um, is in the really deep sea. This this stuff that you can see in the seismics that's hundreds of uh, meters uh, scale or even kilometers. And if you go to more high density turbidity currents, then we talk about tens of meters. And in um, uh, in fluvial settings, this is typically within the meter scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huge range. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like like the flows, they are as variable as the flows themselves. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, um, thank you again for the wonderful uh, presentation today. We really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining us um, for this SEDS Online webinar. Join us next week at our normal time, 4 p.m. UK time, um, when Domenica um, Chiarella will be talking about mixed plastic and carbonate systems. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye.